Hey, good morning, everybody. How we doing today? Appreciate you guys coming down to Grassroots for uh, our fertilizer seminar. And I tell you what, I was looking around the yard the other day, and stuff is springing up. I got bulbs coming up. I saw the, the jasmine on the fence swelling up, getting getting ready to bloom. It's pretty yellow. So we are right around the corner. Spring is going to be here, and uh, it is getting very close to fertilizer time. And I'm happy to say that we now carry the Herald fertilizer that uh, Mr. Gerald and Brother Ted carried out at Nurseries Carolina for quite some time. So happy to say we got that as a slow release. Of course, Gerald's gonna tell us all about that here in just a minute. And then uh, something else I was gonna mention too, so I got this little camera right here. So if, uh, I've been recording all the seminars that we've been having here lately, we put them on our YouTube channel, which is Grassroots Gardening. So if you are unable to come one Saturday, you can go to our channel and get all the information right there we've got coffee donuts popcorn back there so y'all help yourself and mr jared i'm gonna turn it over to you buddy all right can y'all hear me okay right. i'm not used to this crazy thing but we'll, we'll we'll figure it out i'm gonna have to go by my notes i guess uh i never have notes y'all know that but, but um chad's got a wonderful young lady courtney and she is good at organizing me <laughs> she's just real good at that um Fertilizer, wow, that's a big subject. Um, but it's very important and it's important to know timing and all that um, and, and how to apply it and um, the different kinds of fertilizer. And um, so we'll just jump right in. Um, there's three main ingredients uh, like 10 10 10 or 16 4 8 or our famous one is 21 4 9. Um, the nitrogen, and this is very, very, very basic. But the nitrogen is kind of like the green and grove, uh, and it's the most costly of all the elements in the fertilizer. Um, and normally, like 10 10 10 is straight what we call ammoniacal nitrogen. If you hold it in your hand, it'll burn your hand. If you got a cut in it, it'll um, melt right there. And it's gone in three weeks. Uh, so when you're using a cheap fertilizer, you're only getting to use, a, it's only a third of it is utilized by the plant, and two thirds are going to China, of course, in China, but it, it breaks down. But it's not used, so you're buying stuff that's really not used anyway, but there's other forms of nitrogen that we'll get into that. Um, then the phosphorus is the slowest of all of the elements if you use superphosphate, which 99% of the fertilizers use superphosphate, and it moves in the ground a quarter of an inch a year. Uh, so it doesn't move very much. And when I was, we first started, 10, 10, 10 was just everywhere, and that's everywhere what everybody used. And um, they would start, they would use it every year, maybe sometimes two or three times a year, because you're trying to get the green out of the nitrogen which is only less than three weeks. Well, you gradually get a buildup. In other words, the first year you got 10, 10, 10, the second year you got 10, 20, 10, the third year you got 10, 30, 10. It's not exactly like that, but it's a buildup. And a lot, some of the states, Maryland in particular, um, you cannot buy phosphorus without a prescription from your county agent. In other words, you have to send a sample plant, I mean, to Maryland, and if they say you could use phosphorus, fine, but they use so much that it's built up so much in the hole, and then it gets in the, in the water and everything like that, because it does not break down good at all. What's your remedy? Do you have to like dig to spread it out or what? Um, that would help, but just don't use any more until you need it. Now, I'm gonna get into it, but the phosphorus in the super flow we sell, the 2149 Harrells, it is a totally different phosphorus than any other one, and it actually dissolves. So um, when you're using that, you're not getting the buildup. Now, if you've used it in the past, like you say, maybe just turn it in, and I keep turning it in, and that'll help. Um, then the potash, all right, um, phosphorus is, the main thing is root stimulation. Very good for that. It helps develop the root system. 
And um, a lot of the rose growers will use uh, triple superphosphate, which is 0, 47, 0, 45, 0, I forget what it is. Um, and they'll put that in the hole and mix it in the dirt when they plant the rose so that it's right there with the roots so it does stimulate the roots. Uh, but with the harrows, you won't need to do that. You can just, well, you mix that in there and that'll do it too. Um, and the potash is, they all work together. So when I'm saying this is so basic, but it's, um, it's just helping with the hardiness of the plant. It helps develop blooms and things like that. Um, and it's the quickest releasing, well, it releases about like nitrogen, it releases pretty quickly. Uh, it's what you find in, um, in ash, you know, wood ash and things like that. Um, you can get all these pretty much in organic type. Nitrogen is the hardest to get, um, and that's got to be usually in a, in a manure of some kind. The problem with it, it even in a manure stage, and listen, I love organics. Uh, they have got so many qualities that you can't get in a fertilizer, but uh, they don't last long. And so um, when you are using an organic, you gotta do it quite often. And I'll, I'll try to get into um, to some of that too. Um, yes? Can you use, I hear this accident, the wood ashes in your flower bed? I, like, I do all the time. Well, I'm pretty negative when I'm trying to put it together. Because I know long ago my parents did it too. Yeah. But I've heard some bad things, so I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I think it's fine. It probably, if you are sus suspicious of what it's doing, maybe send the sample to Clemson and see what they say. What about coffee grounds? We love coffee grounds. Okay. And um, Ryan ought to be selling coffee grounds. He takes. <laughs> Um, six to uh, what five or six tractor trailer loads a day, seven days a week of coffee grounds. Uh, you're gonna have to start selling it, you know. I think we should. If they will get us a bin down there, we'll just start selling I think you need to, but he gets that from a uh, Starbucks that has a plant down in South Augusta. Eight, six to eight tractor, six, seven tractor trailer loads a day, every day. Yep. Yeah, that is a bunch. Okay, um, mineralogs and trace elements. Now, that's where I can't stop talking about the Harold's fertilizer, but that's, you cannot find those. I thought Miracle Grow had it. One online miracle grow might have iron in it, I think it's, it's one or two you find it. Yeah. But it doesn't have anything. No, no homeowner type fertilizer has any trace elements in it. Maybe zinc or iron. That might be it, but most times they don't have anything. But they'll say, oh, we got iron in it. Well, that's all we got. Whereas there's six of them that we need. There's the iron, zinc, copper, molybdenum, boron, manganese. Not magnesium. Magnesium is what's in line. But manganese is one. And you need microscopic amounts of these. But you'll get, every now and then you'll get some really weird problem. Uh, I saw something on roses one time. The leaves were what we call strapping, get real skinny and thin. And Clemson said it, they didn't have to do what you call a leaf analysis and all of it. Found that it was missing zinc, so it's just weird. But when you use this all the time and you use it at microscopic amounts, it's just healthy. Um, and that's the only fertilizer you're gonna find in the sky. Um, the fertilizer we are selling in this, this blue stuff is 12 month, and we'll go through it real good. But um, it's our commercial fertilizer that we use in our containers uh, in the field. When you have a half million cans, you don't want to go out every two, three months and fertilize them with the table for the fertilizer. Um, so this one, after we went through a lot of different fertilizer, Osmocote was the first one. Osmocote will not last around here at all. Um, we were getting the 12 to 14 month Osmocote, which you're paying big bucks for, and we would get three to four months out of it. Uh, and you just can't afford that. And even the big nursery, Dudley's and McCorpus and all, find that out too. 
University of Georgia did um, research on fertilizers to find out what was the most economical fertilizer um, to use. And they said, oh, <laughs> it was real funny, the, uh, the uh, professor from University of Georgia, he said, I'm a coach in the South in the Southeast. He said, that's not terrible. It's, it's too humid and it breaks down too quick. Uh, and you know, the only way you buy some coat is, is a little container of it at Lowe's Home Depot. And it's real expensive and it says it lasts three months. For around here, it probably wouldn't last a month or just a month and a half. Um, but the Herald's just going to do, do the lasting for it. I can't get away from talking about it. Um, I went to organics. Organics are great uh, for medicinal, am I saying that right? Medicinal uses. Um, it, it really helps in the microorganisms in the soil. It's, it's important. Um, I don't want to um, not tell you about it because it is good, uh, but it does not last long, so you have to do it fairly often. Um, but you find a good one you like. Some of them like um, mushroom combos, uh, cow manure, chicken manure is real good. Uh, chicken manure is, if you get it fresh out of a coop, be careful, it will burn your plants. So don't do that. You know, a chicken poops and pees in the same will make the same thing. So <laughs> you get a lot of nitrogen in it, so it'll burn if you're not careful. But if you buy it in the bag, they have it in bags and it's already kind of been composted. Yes. Uh, Gerald, we've had very good luck with that chicken manure compost. Right, well, that's what you sell. And, and that helps, especially in pots. Right. Because you don't have to water quite as often. Oh, okay. It helps retain the water. Well, good. And that's it's good stuff. Um, and they have, they have a good supply of that. Good. Yeah. Uh, we were selling it too, and um, they've been selling it too. Um, one of my favorites now, do y'all have the um, worm casting? We do, yes sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of my favorites is the worm castings. Y'all, that has amazing uh, medicinal qualities. Um, we had a, a, a lady, that, a friend of ours, and she had an indoor plant that had sticky scale all over it. I don't know if y'all ever had that happen, but it's bad. And um, we told them to use some worm castings on it, and they cleared it up. Um, it's the you know it goes up through the root system. It's kind of systemic on it, and it does work. Um, I had a man tell me, all right, if you plant a vegetable garden and you plant squash, you're gonna get squash vine borers. How many of y'all have experienced that? That's just oh, it's terrible. I, I just quit. I could not ever get get them without it. Well, I had a man for three years in a row before we closed. Um, he was using it around his squash. Now, timing is important. Put it on there immediately when you plant it. Um, even if you plant the seed, put it in the ground like right that. And then about every two or three weeks, put some more. And it'll keep the squash vine borders off, which is absolutely amazing because nothing else will. You can use all the the chemicals and all the organics you can find, but it doesn't keep them off. But he swore up now that that's, that was all right and he could grow squash. Because I can't grow squash because of that. I can't grow tomatoes anyway, so anybody can tell me how to grow tomatoes. I'll tell you how, but I can't grow them. <laughs> we won't go there right now. Um, but uh, the, the organics are very important. Um, just remember they don't last long. The, the research the University of Georgia did, um, y'all, I'm a Clemson man all through and through, but I do listen. The neat thing about our universities uh, in the Southeast, they compare researches so that they don't duplicate it. Uh, so, you know, they have a board that meets like North Carolina State, Clemson, uh, University of Georgia, Auburn, and it's Mississippi, one of the Mississippi, I think Mississippi State. All of those are what we call land grant schools that have agricultural parts, and they compare. Before they do researches, they, they make sure they're not duplicate. And so they'll share with each other, which is great. 
Um, well, when University of Georgia did the research, um, they on the like the Osma Code and the Heralds and cow manure, chicken manure, um, milorganite, um, uh, 10, 10, 10, 16, 4, 8, all those, um, and they came up with Harold was the most the most expensive, probably, but the most economical because we only had to fly at one time. Um, but we will we will kind of well, I'm I'm kind of there right now. So um, it's a twenty one four nine. Okay, people say, how's that gonna work on a tomato plant? That's too much nitrogen. The the thing about it when it's a twelve month release, you divide twelve into twenty one and you get two percent a year. I mean two percent a month. That's great for the tomato plant. Uh, it's not gonna be exactly that by any means, but it is. Uh, it's kind of like that. And then the four is the phosphorus. And the phosphorus in this particular fertilizer does dissolve. It's not going to be locked like the superphosphate in your 10 10 10 or all the other fertilizers. Uh, even Scott's, all these important fertilizers, their phosphorus is not going to dissolve. It's going to build up. But normally in the, in the long fertilizers like Scott's or, or Miracle Grow, something like that. It's going to be a, a small amount. It's not like 10 to 10. 10 to 10 was just, you know, so cheap. You know, you could buy a $5 bag when I, we started out, 50 pound bag. And if you got some real good, um, it had zinc and iron in it. That was rainbow, super rainbow. And, uh, but it has iron and zinc in it. And we, but it's still quick release. Like I said, the nitrogen in the cheap fertilizers last three weeks and it's totally dissolved uh, and that's what you may be paying for when you get fertilized like that uh, so when you're fertilizing um, if you want quick green uh, use them well don't use 10 10 10 because that's going to get the phosphorus to build up um, but that will green it up quick when, when girl called me back around um, October and she said that uh, she wanted to, she had some rye grass that she planted in, uh, in September and it was looking great, but it was a little off color. So she went and got some ammonia nitrate, which I think you have to sign for it now because it, you know, it can be explosive. <laughs> but um, she got some and threw it out on her, uh, her rye grass, which she was having in wedding in two weeks. And she threw it out on the right grass, kill every bit of it. And it just, it was, uh. So it's so quick releasing, like I say, you know, you'd hold it in your hand, it'll burn your hand. Um, and it, you can just feel it. it. It's what you call hydroscopic, in other words, it absorbs uh, moisture from the air, the humidity in the air. If you, we always suggest once you open a bag of fertilizer to um, put it in a bucket with a lid. Now, the Harrells probably is the least hydroscopic of all of them. Uh, if you leave the bag open, it probably wouldn't um, draw water, you know, pour water in. But still, it's better to put it in a five gallon bucket with a lid. Uh, and you don't have to clamp it down so hard. <laughs> Although, I went to get some coffee grabs from his mouth of coffee grabs back here the other day. And they put the lids on that. I like never got the lids on of the buckets, <laughs> but you don't have to do that. But you don't. You do want to make sure it stays pretty well sealed. Um, but the the Harold's is a twelve month feed, and that and people say, well, how often do you have to put it out? <laughs> I said, once a year, twelve months. It lasts twelve months. And they say, well, when do you put it out? Really, um, you can almost put it out any time, but it is best to put it out in the spring. Now, um, one of the most important things I'm gonna tell you all today, do not fertilize your lawn until May. Do not fertilize. And all your lawn services are gonna start in March. 
in, in, in April and for like, here's why. Number one, the grass cannot utilize the fertilizer, the, the nitrogen, until it's fully green. Okay, well we're trying to green it up quick so it keep, but it, well, it doesn't work. Um, but so you're wasting your money there. But the main problem is when you fertilize early, um, it causes fungus to get in your grass. Well, um, you know, I think everything comes from the University of Georgia with a little bit of, you know, I have to make sure they're right. <laughs> and they, they are. I'm just picking on them because, but anyway, um, they, uh, they, uh oh, I lost the train of thought there. Fungus. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I needed. It causes fungus to get in your grass. So it's what I did that summer is I started asking. Everybody came in with fungus in their grass. And I said, when did you fertilize it? Oh, we fertilized in March. I said, okay. We fertilized in April. So all of them that came in uh, fertilized too early. And it, it caused fungus to get in the grass. So there's two reasons not to do it. Um, Number one, you can't use it to start with. Number two, it's going to cause fungus to get in the grass. Yes? How about on Okay, no, you can. Now that's fine. All right. Uh, on the shrubs, you can fertilize in um, starting pretty quick. I wouldn't fertilize quite yet, uh, but uh, in March, middle March is a good time. And um, But the harrows, like I say, you can always fertilize any time, but we normally say uh, March and April. Uh, but it's going to last the whole year. Now, uh, people, what about lime? Okay, he had talked about lime last week. Y'all, I came and listened to it, and it was one of the most interesting talks I've heard. And I give the lime talk, but he gets really, I don't want to say technical, because he makes it where everybody can understand it. But he does get technical. Um, and he tells you the statistics and all the percentages and all this stuff. Y'all, lime is so extremely important. And I kind of make it very simple. Lime, it, fertilizer is kind of like the food. But lime is kind of like the vitamins and minerals. It's not really, but it's kind of like the vitamins and minerals. And so the fertilizer is not going to work if you don't have the right pH. Or certain parts of it will work, but certain parts won't. Uh, and you can find charts that will show you the pH of the soil and what is available at that pH. Like iron might not be available at the pH of 5.5, five, which a lot of our soils are going to be below 5.5 five, five or 5.5. Five, five. Um, you, you need it up. But it's, it's, see, you know, you'll say, well, that thing needs iron. Okay, fine. The iron is probably there. So when you line it, it brings the pH to where it can be utilized. So lime is so extremely vital. And it's the cheapest product you can probably buy. Um, and it's cheap. Now people come in the nursery and they would say, I say, well, you probably need some lime for your yard. Uh, well, give me, give me a, two bags. And I say, the average yard needs 10 bags a year. The average yard needs 10 bags. Your yard might be a little bit smaller than that, but the average yard needs 10 bags a year. Um, so, lime. Yes? Can you put lime on indoor plants? You sure can, and it's important to do that because they run, they run, um, when they've been in that soil, it leaches out. Lime doesn't leach much, but it will leach out. Okay. Um, and using a quality lime is important. And Ted went through that last week. Uh, it's what we do to find a quality lime is we like the long lime that's pelletized. Well, before it's put in a pellet, it's been ground up. And you look on the back of the bag and it'll show you what we call the screen analysis. And you look for the 100 mesh screen, that's easy to remember, 100 mesh screen. And you want at least 70% going through 100 mesh screen. I think what they've got in now is 75 or 80, which is really good. Um, I'll tell you my line story real quick. Um, 
we needed lime and we knew that was the most important thing. Uh, back 45, 50 years ago, when you got pelletized lime, we got it. It was only one of the level. It was Georgia Marble Company sold lime, pellet lime in bags. Well, it's what it was. It was a, when they saw the marble, it was the sawdust that comes off of that. It's like gravel, like little gravel. And you throw it out there, and it wouldn't do anything. Paul Blankenship, I use Paul's name all the time. He's got 500 of the most gorgeous roses in, in the southeast. And Paul said he would use a shovel full of lime, of that pellet lime, a year on his roses, and the pH was still rocking. He said it, it was just not useful. A shovel full a year. Uh, well, we convinced him to use our. At that time, there was not a good pellet lime, so we were using the powder lime. And uh, we would make sure it would. So I went to the trade show, I don't know about Tractor Pro Love the Lime, because it was one company that we really liked because it had 80% going through 100 base green. Well, I got to the show and I looked at the bag and I said, wait a minute, that's 35% through 100 base green. And he said, oh, we found that's not really important. Uh, it's, it, it's, uh, and I just, I said, don't tell me, and I just walked away. And I didn't know what I was going to do with the lime. So the next week, one of my salesmen came in and he said, um, what, uh, he said, you need some lime? And I said, yeah, I need some lime, but it depends on what the screen count is on. He said, oh, I don't know what you think about that. He said, let's call it plant. So it was White Limestone Company in James River, Virginia. So he called up and he, um, Got a guy on the phone and he said, he said, my customer wants to know, know something, can you tell him? And I said, what is your screen count on your pelletized lime on their screen? And he said, I don't know. He said, but let, hold on a minute, let me get my boss. And Mr. White came over the phone. So I said, Mr. White, can you tell me what your screen count or screen analysis is on your 100 day screen? And uh, he said, why do you want to know? I said, well, all lime has calcium and magnesium in it, but is it available? And he said, hallelujah. I said, what, what's wrong? And he said, nothing wrong. He said, but I've been in the lime business all my life. And he said, you were the first person to ever ask that question. And he said, that is the most important thing on lime. And he said, before I get my cup of coffee in the morning, I'm reading that screen analysis to see. And he said, I got to come meet you. And he said, I'll tell you what. Um, at that time, he said, uh, I think it was 75 or 80 percent was going through a 200 mesh screen. So, I mean, it was really good stuff. And he said, I got to come meet you. He said, kind of, so he came down to, it, it met me and everything. And I, by that, and I sold it, not sold it, but I told all the nurseries of Augusta about that, that that was a high quality line. And he said, Next time he came out, he said, girl, it's got to be a sink hole here in Augusta. I said, why? He said, because there's so much lime. You sell so much lime here. He said, it's got to be a sink hole. But he came down to visit me twice. I mean, to visit with us twice. But lime is super important. Um, now, don't get lime and fertilizer confused. Uh, it is not a fertilizer. But some people will put it out. And all of a sudden, everything greens up, everything's not looking good, and you think it's a fertilizer. Well, it's what it's doing is making the fertilizer that you've had out there all along, or the nutrients in the soil, all along, it's making them available. So um, it's just, it's not fertilizing it, but it's making them available. They work hand in hand, yes, ma'am. So you can't fertilize until that, can you put lime out? You can, yes, you can. All right. She said, you can't fertilize the way that you can fertilize shrubs in March and April, but long in May. But you can lime anything now. Yes. I want to say one thing about lime. It's my lime story. So I was up in Western North Carolina, which is a property up there, and went to buy some lime at a very reputable nursery. The screen analysis after y'all's place was zero, which means that all it was good for was chomping off the baseball field. And I, t I tried to explain that to them. <laughs> it's so it's so unknown. It's why we Ted was out uh, at, he was at Clemson 
and he went to a class at Camp Crusade for Christ in San Bernardino, California. Well, he met another guy out there that was in horticulture, and he he told he started telling Ted about a line, and he told Ted about a book that he had, and the book was published in the 50s, I guess, you know, or the early 60s. Ted's real old, but <laughs> he's only three years old today. But anyway, hey, um, hey, uh. The, the book is what Ted uses to base, of course he's got a lot of other research on that too, but the book was showing how important lime is. Um, they were liming a, uh, I mean, y'all go online and it's, um, you go to um, YouTube and uh, go to uh, Grassroots Gardening. Grassroots Gardening and pull up that lime talk, you think it's boring. No, it's not boring. It is very interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and he'll he'll explain how important it is. Well, I, I didn't really, I learned two things mainly last week. I learned a lot, but two things. He was liming hydrangeas. You know, our mom had blue and pink hydrangeas. They're not supposed to be put in full sun. But if you lime them good, they'll take it. They'll take it. It's what it does, it, it you, it drives the roots deeper, and, I, and it's not doing that. It's what it's doing is making the roots be able to develop down deep. So if if you've got hydrangeas that look like they're suffering from too much sun, try to line them. I'll now, touch a handful. I know. No, no, no more than a handful. <laughs> um, we're saying a a cup in a three by three area. But actually, Ted was saying after we kind of calculated that, we were saying two cups of three by three here. You cannot line too much. Don't ever worry about it yet. When you're, when you're applying it with um, you know, some fertilizer, mm -hmm. you have, would you just mix it together and just like pop We it? do. Just we do it all the time. He said when you're applying it together, can you mix them? What we do is we take two cups of lime and one cup of fertilizer use that mix. Now Ted was doing four cups of lime yeah. and one cup of fertilizer. But uh, two cups is what I know. All right, uh, if you'll see on the little chart here, pints a pound or all around. And I've researched that a little this week to see if that old saying really works. It is pretty close. Um, and you know, it's close enough, like I say, for government work anyway. But it's close enough. Um, so, if you're doing a ton to the acre, which is what normally Clemson or Georgia recommends, uh, that calculates down to about a, a cup in a three by three area. That's an eight ounce cup, not a little coffee cup, an eight ounce cup. Now you can go more than that if you want to. And, um, and your blueberries, it says don't line them, line them. <laughs> You won't believe the difference it'll make. Uh, it's incredible, it really is. Um, so, I hope you got plenty of money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was some work to get line of the last week's talk, but, we, but, but they got it. So. <laughs> uh, it's always going to have to drive a couple hundred miles to get it, but he was able to get it. Uh, okay. Uh, Timing, like I said, wait for fertilizer, wait till May. That is very important. And if you got these long people, listen, if you can possibly push a spreader, don't hire them. Uh, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg and they're going to do the wrong thing all the time. Uh, I hate to say that, but. Um, 90% of them out there are just, you know, they've got a thousand lawns, and so they got to start early to get them all. <laughs> You're going to be one of the thousand, and uh, they might start in, in February. I have um, one company, uh, no, I'm not going to tell you who it was, but one company, fertil uh, not fertilizer, but they used a fungicide on one of my 90 year old customers on their yard in January, which you can't tell whether it's got a fungus in there or not, 
not to do you any good, absolutely killed her along and I wouldn't do anything about it. I was so furious that I called Clemson because I got a pesticide applicator's license. Well, I called Clemson and I said, what can we do? He said, we can't do anything, but tell me who it is. I said, well, they're, they are going to dust them. He said, don't you worry. They will rue the day they came to South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we can't sue them. We can't prove it was that, but we, you know it was. And uh, But don't worry. We're going to be on them. <laughs> <laughs> they they probably will not come in Augusta, in North Augusta anymore. Um, so uh, shrubs, March and April, fruit trees, March and April. Um, don't fertilize so late, like in. Um, try not to start in, in September, October, fertilizing. I'm gonna get there to um, because you can stimulate growth by fertilizing too late. Now the harrows won't do much of that, but if you stimulate growth, then the, the um, frost or whatever in October, November will damage that deep growth. So it's not good to start that late. Um, like we were saying, um, Karen, oh, <laughs> they're right here. I was giving this talk one time and she was sitting there listening and I said, now, when you apply fertilizer, um, just store on top of the mulch, don't dig it in. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. And so uh, she's got one of everything. We, we, we've got maybe two or three of them, but she's got a little of everything in her yard. And uh, she said, um, well, I get out there and pull the mulch back and dig it in. And she said, you mean I just throw it on top? I said, yeah, she bought six bags that day, I think. <laughs> six 50 bag bags. 2,000 pounds of lime bag. Did you two, really? Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, it's incredible, y'all. If, if you do it right and it's not so costly, you know, you think it is. I will tell you a story about one of my customers. He called me. He called me yesterday just to check on because he misses us. I miss y'all too. I really do. But um, not enough to open her. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he called me uh, and he said, how you doing at all? Well, anyway, he had a yard kind of like uh, Karen's, but um, he, um, he had a, uh, he's a golf pro, so he loves his grass. And he kept his Bermuda like a golf course green, you know. And I said, um, but I said, you need to try this fertilizer. And we hadn't started using our lawns at that time. So I said, just put it on all your shrubs. And he's got, Karen, believe it or not, he's got two of everything we got. <laughs> uh, but um, he put it around his shrubs. And I said, Steve, you need to try it on your um, on your lawn. And uh, he said, okay, I'll do that. So I told him how much to put. And uh, he came back the next year and he said, well, it hurt horses. And I said, what do you mean, well, it hurt horses? He said, if I put it on my wife's horse pasture. I said, no, they can't eat enough to hurt them and it probably wouldn't anyway. And he said, well, I want 40 bags. And I said, a hundred dollar bag, you want 40 bags? He said, I want 40 bags. He bought 47 that year. Well, when I told the salesman about it, he was just, he just laughed and he said, Gerald, the thing about it is this fertilizer is designed to be in a container under irrigation every day. And he said, he's gonna put it on a field that's gonna get watered only when it rains. He said, it's gonna last him two, three, four years. And sure enough, his, his bath stayed green for like three or four years. Great, didn't, and it, you know, they, the horse people were telling me, they said if you give too much nitrogen um, in the field, it will give horses colic. I don't know much about horses. I grew up on Tennessee Walkers, but I still don't know much about horses. But um, so the thing about this is, is it's not going to give it too much nitrogen at one time to to hurt them. So it's. I mean, you know, it paid for itself the first time, but then when it lasted three or four years, it just kept on paying for itself. 
Now in the yard, you're going to water and irrigate it probably, so you're not going to get it to last that long, but you will get it to last a while. Yes, ma'am. Well, you said something on here about azaleas are heavy feeders, yes. so do you give them twice as much the one time? They or would love it. But <laughs> or, or do you do it multiple okay. times a year? She said, um, with azaleas, I say on there they're heavy feeders. And if y'all see things I've missed, please bring it up because I'm not used to using notes. <laughs> but um, you might give them a little extra, and you could do it a second time. It will not hurt them. Okay. Um, but uh, you can, um, Isaiah's just need a lot. All right, let me, let me tell you why. Lime your Isaiah's. Yes, <laughs> lime your Isaiah's too. And that is a no-no according to Clemson and University of Georgia. No, you can't lime Isaiah's. You can't lime blueberries. They're acid-loving. Well, we don't consider them as acid-loving as we do consider them acid-tolerating. In other words, you see an azalea that does good in an acid situation, nothing else will grow there but a but an azalea or a blueberry. And uh, it's not, they love acid, but they want a few plants that will tolerate it. So you lime them, they love lime. You give them lime and they'll just perform like crazy. Um, it's not that they don't like, uh, but they want a few plants that will grow in that situation. Um, she was asking about azaleas, okay. Azaleas, have you ever noticed in the fall they'll start turning yellow leaves underneath and reddish leaves on the pink and red ones? Um, and they just look bad. Well, if you fertilize them good, they will look great year round. It's what it is, they just run out of food. And so when you keep that food to them, now if you, now that's one of the plants I have fertilized in like October, and that's okay. Now let me tell you why the timing is important there. You fertilize in August or September, and that possibly could stimulate growth. Um, and you don't want to do that. Now if you've got the harrows down there, it's going to give them a steady feed anyway, and it's not going to give them too much. But um, by fertilizing, uh, waiting until they're not going to be stimulated, in the October, if you fertilize in October, that's not going to give them time to stimulate. Um, so they that'll carry them through real good. But if you use the harrows, it shouldn't need the second application if you used enough. And you can use more, all right, like on a lawn. Um, I think we say 50 pounds for 10,000 square feet. And this stuff's $120 a bag, is that right? $130. Um, and you say, um, that's a lot of money for fertilizing, but when it only it lasts you the whole year, it's not, and then you don't have to apply it for one time, it's not expensive, um, it's not as expensive. But um, it's just gonna give you a steady fee. Well, I like the golf pro, he just doubled up on it, and it turned it green as green can be. And then, uh, but you just have to mow it more. Um, yes. When you when you fertilize in May, yeah. Should you is it better for the lawn if you first scalp it and aerate it before you fertilize? It? Um, that's kind of a, up to the yard, I think. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be, but if you want to do it, that's fine. Um, that's a good time, the timing and all to do that. Uh, he's asking about um, scalping that way down. You gotta be careful with grasses. Uh, there's a lot of carbohydrates stored in that stem. And it it's best to keep them low all the time. And people say, well, that's not what the book says. Well, Clemson and the University of Georgia are right on that. They will tell you hikes to keep them at. When you keep them at that height all the time, you don't gradually raise them more through the year. And everybody wants to do that. All right, let me tell you why that happens. Um, if you cut your lawn every two weeks, you're gonna scalp your Bermuda. You're just gonna scalp it. If you cut it once a week, you're gonna scalp it. Um, and for two or three days, it's gonna look rough. If you cut it twice a week, it looks great. 
But you keep it low. I know that's that's hard to do. But let me tell you, do not bag. Do not bag and see if you cut it once a week or once every two weeks, you're gonna have to bag probably. So if I cut it twice a week, you won't have to bag, and that simplifies a lot. Um, so keeping it low all the time is real important. Does that also apply to Georgia? Yes, Georgia. I don't have the heights, but um, half inches for me. Um, and then Georgia might be a half inch to an inch. Um, then centipede, y'all keep centipede as low as you can. And that could be a, an inch. All right, I'll tell you why I'm centipede. Um, when we first opened, we called centipede a seven year grass. What's that? Poor man's grass. Well, we call it poor man's grass because it doesn't need fertilizer. And it literally doesn't need fertilizer or rarely. And we call it poor man's grass. That's right, we did. Uh, but um, after about six or seven years, it started to die out. And why, you know, it was good long, and it just started dying out on you. Because what we, what we were doing back then at Clemson and University of Georgia was saying, uh, it's got nematodes, because every sample we'd send in had nematodes. And nematodes is a microscopic, like the worm that burns the root and won't let it develop. Uh, so we were sending Nemagon, y'all, y'all. That's that was some bad stuff. We broke a bottle in the nursery one day. It was glass bottles at that time, and I stepped in it, and my boots burned my feet for a week. And you know that's not healthy. <laughs> I probably should have thrown the boots out, but I did. Uh, I was too cheap. I'm still here, though. See. <laughs> um, but then they said, no, it's not nematodes, it's brown patch fungus. So for another 10 or 15 years, we sold more dicotyl than you could shake a stick at. And we wouldn't get the little homeowner size, we'd get the commercial size. And people were putting dicotyl on their lawns and it, was, it helped with the brown patch. But then um, about 20 years ago, I think it was North Carolina State did a lot of research on what was cause it's going to be to die out. And it's what they found out is that it is a lazy man's grass, but if you don't mow it very low and once a week, and it doesn't need the twice a week thing, but if you, if what you're doing is centipede, well, if you don't mow it low, it doesn't get about that high anyway. You know, if you never mowed it, it wouldn't look real bad, but it climbs up on top of itself and then when you have a bad winter, it, uh, it gets winter kill because it's not laying on the ground, it's laying on the layer of the grass. So um, you, you mow it to force it to lay low and you're kind of keeping it thatched that way too. In other words, you're not getting that big old patch under it that's bad. Um, so by forcing it low, so mow it once a week and um, it just, just do it. And um, now, centipede it probably is fine for one. It is fine once a week. Uh, well, it was a month ago. Once a week, and fertilize it very lightly. If you fertilize it at all, you probably. But um, the Harold's, if you fertilize it with that lightly. In other words, a bag of that, the 50 pound bag covers 10,000 square feet, and centipede would cover 20,000 square feet. So, um, so what was causing the little knots? You were talking about the little knots and the centipede. And okay, okay, good. Um, I had a lady call me and she said, my centipede grass is jumping. And I said, what do you mean jumping? She said, well, you know how the runners go out? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, well, mine won't attach to the ground. They go up in the air. And I said, really? And so I had heard a talk from one of our salesmen that said that Scott's Hawks is definitely not for centipede or St. Augustine at all. And it will, so it's what was happening is the hawks is a preventer, crabgrass preventer and a poam preventer. And um, it's just not good for southern grasses. But if what was happening is the grass would run out and when the roots would put down, 
they would turn into little balls and otherwise won't penetrate. So it'll do that to St. Augustine and Timothy. Uh, it'll make you jump and then you mow it, your grass just gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And finally, so do not use Scott's hogs. They sell the atrazine that we recommend, which is a pre-emergent and post-emergent, but it's pre-emergent mainly. Uh, use that as a pre-emergent in the fall and in the spring, and you'll be safe. Now we have seen a little bit of um, intolerance, what do you call it? Uh, not intolerance to um, some of the weeds. Uh, the weeds have developed a immunity to it. Yes. Gerald, a few years back, we used uh, uh, the barricade. barricade. Yes. That we got, it caused clubbing of the roots. Okay, well, that does the same thing. And I lost um, 80% of my centipede. Really? So well, see, that's the same as Hall's. Scott's Hall's is just like that. Yeah, same thing. Right. Um, clubbing of the roots. So it causes clubbing of the roots. In other words, the root has See, it's what a pre emergent does is it doesn't kill seed, but when the seed sprouts and tries to put root down, it won't let root penetrate. So you gotta be careful. Um, a lot of these commercial guys that come in and do, they're gonna use barricade or, or some of these things that are not good for centipede grass. The only one I feel safe with is um, is that, that atrazine that we, he sells in a 50 pound bag, right now that's cheap as can be. And it'll do 10,000 square feet, 12,000 square feet. Uh, yes. So I, I have some atrazine and a patch of grass that I want to kill and put a bed in. Uh, can I use the atrazine to prevent the grass from growing back and then put new plants in like shrubs, or would that impact their ability? I don't know. That would impact their ability. It's, it is strictly plums. So don't use it in a flower bed at all. Um, what you're gonna have to do there, let me, let me what you're gonna have to do there is if you can, do you have grassy weeds going in there? We just put a plastic down in the grass yeah, for like, like, like six months. Well hopefully that'll do it. But now once you plant, then use the preen extended control. Not regular preen, y'all. Regular preen is useless, but it's preen extended control is good. All right, and there's also one called Roundup yeah. Wheat or Grass Preventer. That's good too. Um, but none of these are used in the lawn, they're just used in, all right, and there's another one. Um, it's called XL2G, and that's commercial. And um, it comes in a 50 pound bag, and this is about $100. But it is the old maze. <laughs> Y'all, no, we had one a, a week. I can't get it now. No, you can get that. He said it was commercial. Where well, you still buy it? Where do I buy it now? Then? Well, I know, uh, I know Stovall. Okay. I'll, I'll see if you can. But I know oh. Stovall and Augusta carries it because I went in there Thursday or so and found it. Where's that? Okay. And that's great. Amazing. That's a commercial place, but you can go in there. Um, we had one called a maze, and it was amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> and it's a preventer of seeds. So you plant the plant, and I like to give it a couple weeks and then put something like a maze on it or like this pre-extended control or the roundup, and that'll prevent some of the weeds from coming. Now, if you got perennial grasses in there, you have to use Roundup. You just don't have to use it. But it now, works in the flower bed. That's what we need to know. Right, the flower beds. Um, let me see. Yes. Okay, Gerald, um, you talked about all the grasses other than St. Augustine slash Charleston grass, but about heights and stuff. Okay, heights on that is like inch and a half, two inches, maybe two inches. And you don't, you don't want to let it get up too high, but two inches will work. Yes. yes. Now, there's only one hesitation about lime on centipede and St. Augustine. Um, and we're going to try, they're going to be my trial right here. Um, it gets, centipede St. Augustine gets a disease called tachylus. It's kind of a new disease. 
And um, a high pH encourages that disease. Uh, Ted, in his talk last week, he said, I'm not worried about, it's gonna make the plant that much hardier. So that it, and he said it takes so long to change the pH of the lime anyway, he said it's not gonna be a worry. I know, but I'm not gonna take for years. Right, there you go. What did she say? She, she uses it on her centipede lawn for years, and that's just like St. Augustine. So she uses it and it works. Yeah. It actually makes, all right, lime, and I'm giving the lime talk again, uh, but lime makes the plants hardier so the diseases can. And Ted explained all that microscopically last week. It was really neat. It makes the leaves tougher so that the, the mycelium, the, well, I don't know what it's called, won't penetrate the leaf. Yes, sir. Okay, all right, um, I prefer not to bag, um, but you have to mow more often. But to me, it's easier to mow more often than it is to bag, because bagging takes so much time, and you're taking so much nutrients away from the lawn when you do that. Uh, I, I have a little tiny post, my yard is, is two of these. That's it. Two of these. It's and in the middle of the woods. I don't get enough sun, but but anyway, I had a, a real mower, you know, one of these nice little real mowers. And um, and it would throw the cuttings in a in a hopper in front like a golf course green, you know. And I was having to fertilize a living tar out of that. And it was still run out of fertilizer. Well, I, my lawnmower broke down or something, and I just used the regular mower, put a bag in, and it starts great. The clippings have so much nutrition in them, and we worry about thatch. Uh, if, you're, if you're mowing pretty often, that thatch is going to break down. Um, and if you think you're getting a thatch problem, get it de-thatched every couple of years, or every three years. Or aeration, now let me tell you about aeration. I love aeration because aeration makes the um, holes in the ground. And don't use one that just pokes holes in the ground. You want one that pokes holes and pulls the plug up. And the plugs, you let the plugs lay on top of the ground and that helps run the thatch. Um, but by not bagging, you have to mow more often but it's going to make your fertilizer last so much better. Uh, oh, height of meter? <laughs> one to one and a half inches. Okay. Now, if y'all have ever played a common Bermuda seed, worst grass in the world, and if you plant the seed, it's totally, it's the same family, but it's like a chihuahua versus a great thing. Um, the um, hybrid Bermudas are very dwarf and need to be kept that way. Common Bermuda, if you plant it from seed, the problem with common Bermuda from seed uh, is it, the seed is grown in Arizona. And it's not cold hardy here. You're going to lose the first year, you're going to lose 90% of it that you planted. And I had a, a doctor and his wife come in and what y'all came in and they were determined they were going to play for me to see. I said, okay, I don't sell it, but go up there and get it at the feed and seed store. They got it and they, they called me the next year and said, Gerald, you need to come over here. I said, okay. I said, we planted it, it was a gorgeous Bermuda lawn last year, just beautiful. And it was common Bermuda from seed. And she said, See if you can find any Bermuda out here now. I walked in there, y'all, I didn't find a drop of Bermuda because the cold killed it. Uh, so do not plant Bermuda grass seed. It is useless. It is good for one thing. Uh, plant it with centipede seed, and it'll come up quicker and hold the ground. Then next year it'll die. <laughs> You'll have the centipede there. Because centipede is so slow um, from seed. 
Uh, centipede, y'all, if you want to plant centipede with seed, and some people have a large area, it is probably one of the toughest grass seeds you've ever used, but you will not see any results of it from the first from the first year. You'll think, my, let me tell you, it was for my brother. Uh, he wanted to plant in his yard, and he lives right down in the woods with us. And I said, all right, Mark, let me tell you about this. I said, you go plant it. And I said, end of the summer, you're going to come in here and fuss at me because none of it came up. And I said, the next year, you're going to come back and apologize because it all came up. <laughs> and he said, okay, sure enough, August, he said, Gerald, not a drop of that stuff's up. It's just, it's just, dead as a hammer, not a drop of it's up. I said, all right, Mark, what I tell you? And he said, no, I don't believe you in that. Next year he came back and he said, you're right, it's all up. So it takes about a year, but it is tough seed and it works, um, but it's just slow. And all the weeds come up and you don't see the grass, then the next year some people start feeding in that cover. We had three acres of, of centipede when I was a kid. We had three acres of sand spurs. Who, who remembers sand spurs? Okay. All right, not the little burr weed that we have now, but it's sand spur. It actually one came up like this, and we had three acres of sand spur. Um, and Ted, we go to Sears Roebuck on um, 15th Street. Is that right? Sears Roebuck on 15th Street. And they'd have a tractor trailer load on Saturday, every Saturday, they'd have a tractor trailer load. And we'd buy about three pieces of Two by one by two pieces or four or five pieces. Take them home and did three acres. He he plop one down about every five feet in that yard. And doggone it in three years we had a long centipede. It was amazing. It didn't choke all the sand for that. So it was amazing. The only problem is Bahia came in there and kind of took it over. But we were not work mowing it. I would be working a heavy piece of a bulldozer or a pen or something. And then it would make me stay home and mow the lawn. And I'd get a doll for mowing that three acres. <laughs> and then it was eight hours of hard work. And he, one day he said, I got you a brand new lawnmower. And I said, okay. He said, I said, it's a, a round. He said, well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's Armstrong. And uh, I said, Armstrong? I've never heard of that brand. He said, it's an Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first lawnmower he he, uh, he made it, and it was an engine on top of a piece of plate steel, no no skirt around it. It had two airplane tires on the side, a little, you know, airplane tire and one in the front. And we'd cut that, but see, it wouldn't cut it low enough, and we weren't cutting it, but every two weeks. And so gradually, um, the cold killed a lot of it. Then the behavior took over, too. But, uh, uh, yes, ma'am. No. Okay. okay. All right. Do not use Roundup in the lawn. Do not use Roundup in the lawn. I don't care what you read, what you hear. Do not use Roundup in the lawn. Even if you go out there and spot kill weeds, when you spot kill that weed, it's gonna kill about that much grass. It is terrible. Uh, don't use it. There used to be a method that they, I won't tell on you master gardeners, but, <laughs> but anyway, they told a method on how you use it to kill pro out. Now, do not use that method. The golf courses know how, you do not. So do not do it. You will kill your lawn. And I've had too many people that kill their lawn doing it. Um, all right, let me tell you all about Roundup. All right. You see all these ads on the TV. You hear all these ads about the class action suit. You know, you can get your billions of dollars and all this. Roundup is probably the safest chemical we sell. And I'm not kidding. All right, I've been to four seminars on, on Roundup and how safe it is. Clemson, University of Georgia, University of Tennessee, all of those say it is the safest chemical out there. And of course, Monsanto is the fourth one. Of course, you know what they're going to say. But Monsanto really had some interesting research. But all Clemson and Georgia and 
got to stay great with every bit of it. Um, it is, be, be careful with it, yes. Um, they say, well, it doesn't break down in the soil. Yes, it does. It breaks down in the soil. Um, and it is, just don't get it on you. And listen, I bathed in it several times, and I'm still here. I'm 75 years old. Um, but just be careful with it. But it is still the... Y'all don't remember, or some of you remember what the world before Roundup. The only way you got rid of weeds is with a hose. I still got scars on my toes, show for it. Um, but you just had to hoe out the weeds. If you got Bermuda in a, in a flower bed, you were, it was impossible. Um, and don't use Roundup in vegetables. Just, uh, if you want to, that's fine, but um, I'm, I'm, it, they don't, they, it's not on the label. Um, yes, sorry, I'll interrupt you real quick. We got a, a Lincoln MKX parked down by the, uh, where we weigh our rock, and so we've got a customer that needs to get some, some rock weight, so if that's one of those vehicles, if you don't mind moving it real quick for us, okay. I appreciate it. Sorry, all right. that's all right. Um, a Lincoln MKX needs to be moved. Move it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, well, I'm kind of uh, warm my welcome out a little bit, but some more questions, y'all, because when I answer questions, I know I'm getting to the right thing. So yes. what's the best thing to use in my bed? My beds are probably three feet. Get rid of weeds. I keep it mulch really good, but so well, um, use that pre-extended control. All right, let me tell you how those work, y'all. Um, a pre-emergent does not kill any weeds. Um, it prevents them. Okay. Well, if you got weeds in a bed and you put a pre-emergent out there, it's not going to do anything. Um, but if you pull all the weeds up first, um, you put it out then, it's going to prevent the weeds from germinating. Now, if you see a weed come through that, and you will, and every now and then, and you pull it, you just broke your barrier. So weeds don't come up. Yeah, if you dig a whole plant, it's going to broke your barrier. Um, and you maybe could put down some more of that preventer there, but be careful not to get too much down or it'll keep your roots on your plant from developing. Um, but resist pulling weeds. I'm, I'm going to tell you because if you got a pre emergent down, well, even if you don't have a pre emergent down, if you, um, if you have weeds and you pull them, you just pull more seeds and stop the ground, more will come up. And it might not be the same weed, but it's, it, you put a lot of seed up there. You just don't know how many millions of seeds are right there in the ground, and when you pull them, it just won't come up. So be careful. Uh, and then when you have a bed like you're talking about, um, and you see weeds come up after you put the pre emergent out, best thing to do is take a little round up and, and, and spray it. And like I say, get one of those political posters, you know what I'm talking about there. They're plastic cardboard. And if, if Hillary's picture on it, it, it works better with Hillary's picture. But um, hold that right beside the plant and spray so that it um, it doesn't get on the plant. And you, the maze was, I mean, you saw the maze, it was great. Well, the green extended control is good. Um, and <laughs> she still likes the baby. Yeah, well, I like it too. But you can't get it anymore. Well, I don't know whether, Ryan, you want to fool with it, but the surf land comes in a 50 pound bag, $100. Um, and it, it'd probably be 100 or 125. But, um, and it's hard to find. But um, Stovall in Augusta, I hate to be selling on the way, but Stovall in Augusta, um, Real watch and that right? uh, they are they'll um they had I just checked but only in hundred pound bag. Fifty pounds. Hundred dollars but fifty pounds. 
Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. You, you hear what she's saying? In other words, in vast regard to what we used to do is take newspapers. You don't have any newspapers anymore, you know? But you just lay layers of newspaper down between the rows, and uh, you want to pull a ball, show me a pine straw or something like that. That's fine. But that'll keep a lot of them. We say, all right, let me tell you one of my pet peeves that they may carry it. I hate it. I hate it. Ground cloth. I hate ground cloth. I hate ground cloth. You just cannot pay me. First of all, you can't pay me to put it down because it's so much trouble. But secondly, when you it, it lasts about a year, two years, and then we start growing on top of it. And then when you want to plant something else, it's a pain. I hate it. I hate it. Who's got it that hates it? All right, see there? Don't use it. I said, I saw a man, and he had it in his yard. I came in there and I said, we need it. They were going to plant some new plants. And I said, we need to get that ground cloth up. And, uh, you would not believe the mess that man. He took a backhoe in there and he tore that yard all to pieces. Trying to get the mess up, it still was pieces later. You know. Don't use ground cloth. I hate to say it, but I hate it. I hate it. Uh, okay. So when do we put that pre-emergent, maybe a many down before my chamber bitters come up? <laughs> Y'all know what chamber bitter is? My most of weed. Yeah, oh my it has a little seed hanging out all over here. Yeah, That's the scourge of the southeast. Uh, but mimosa trees. Oh yeah, yeah like, that'll do too. Yeah, now, pre-emergent probably won't get my most of the trees because the seed is too big and it, all, it has enough energy to break the barrier. But for you need to get that um, pre-emergent out now. What we normally say is pre-emergent for weeds like the summer weeds. Now see, the winter weeds are already up, but they're going to die. But the summer weed, um, the pre-emergent needs to go down for Scythia bloom. Y'all know what forsythia is, golden bell. When forsythia blooms, you need to get it down right now. You need to have it down a little before that. So that's a good indicator of time. It's better than me saying mid-March. It's better to say when forsythia blooms. Um, there was one other of those little things I was going to tell you about. I'm trying to think. If y'all need to go, you just go. go. We've gone way. I've worn out my welcome. Um, so what's a good Okay, uh, it's called Preen XL2G. I mean, no, Preen Extended Control. Do not use regular Preen. It's you use, yes, Preen Extended Control. Do not use regular Preen. It's useless. Preen, preen is just craft land that prevents only craft grass, which you get all the other weeds to come up. Chamber bed will come up right through it. But Preen Extended Control works, and it'll, it'll, it'll be the one you use. Uh, the, the Roundup one uh, is, I forget what it's called, but it works too. There was one other product I was going to tell you about. Well, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, we have a, a very old tech overgrown in Celia mm -hmm. um, that we need to use some regenerative pruning. Do you have any ideas on that? It's got some dieback, but uh, we want to cut it back. When is the best time? I think it should be after it blooms. I think it be well, you need to do it before it blooms. Okay. All right. Just to, unless you just want to enjoy the blood. No, but I no, do it now. Okay. Now, let me tell you, and I doubt you got it, but you need to use five minutes. Oh, not five minutes. We have Okay. I'm going to have to change that. You're going to have to use. Dithane M45, and I'm, you might have to get that. Yeah, we're not All right. I found out last year that the thigh mill is the Dithane M45 much better. Uh, um, and that's hard to find, but I'll tell you how to find it. Yeah. Um, okay. You had another question? Yeah. 
Okay, um, it's, it, it's safe because it breaks down, but I mean, it only goes in through green foliage. It does not go in through the root or anything like that. It has to be taken in through green foliage. So if you got bare ground, and you can spray around it's not do anything. That's where the pre-extended controls don't work. But the Roundup will kill, like if you get something that comes up in that bed, um, the Roundup, um, you spray Roundup, keep a little bottle of Roundup to spray that. No. <laughs> you paint the squirrel, let them eat them all. But, but they, I, I, think, I think the squirrel plants uh, ten and each five, so, <laughs> or maybe not five, but um, do you think? I keep a nine millimeter in my bag. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> 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 no, a pellet rifle. Uh, a pellet rifle is probably the best thing in the city of Vegas. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, they don't have it. They may get it later, but the 12 month works. It'll work this time. It wasn't six months, it was three to four. It is cheaper, but I still prefer this one because that one you really need to do twice a year. Whereas this one is once. You didn't want to hurt it. Yes, on the lawn. Check it out. That's right. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. He's talking about um, Smilex or Cat Briar, or we got a lot of names we can't say in public, but um, but uh, it, it has that, it's that briar that comes up and you dig it up, it's got that tuber on there. Um, the only way I've ever got it is to cut it off and when it sprouts back new, that what we call tender, sticky new growth, um, you spray it on that and it will get it. Uh, now it may take more than one spray, but it has to be sprayed on that tender new growth. If it's not on that, it won't, it just lasts at all. Um, Mr. Mr. Gerald, I can interrupt you one yes, second. I have to go help uh, Mr. Dave outside. Okay. But we're just talking we do next weekend. Fruit trees. So yes. That's going to be a good one. And we're going to have. I just want to, want to say thank you guys for, for coming. I'm going to run outside. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Brent, Brent Venables. No, not Brent Venables. Brent, Brent Bills is a football coach. Brent Rubles is from Aiken, and his wife is going to bring samples of fruit that they grow here in Aiken. And now he's got a book, a fruit book that is phenomenal. If the world, I mean, but he's written it for Aiken County, and it's here, he's got it. And he'll be here with some of the samples. Oh, um, he brings food for you. Yeah, right. Time. She does. She brings, he brings food. It's so good. It, 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 you know, one of the favorite. What was the favorite one you like? I like the um, palm jelly. Oh, um, I think we had the jelly. We had some persimmon pudding or. Yeah, she oh, had she way. had all kind of little crackers and samples and everything. It's real deep. But the book is phenomenal, y'all. Because he knows that he has got a pair now and I'm gonna Ryan's gonna try to get it. It is a southern Bartlett. Now you can try to grow Bartlett all day long around here and you won't ever get any fruit. But if you grow the southern Bartlett, it's gonna be hard to find, but Ryan's gonna try to get it. Um it loads down and it's incredible and it's just like he, he said it's even better than a bar because it's soft which we don't run soft pairs down here but it's a good pair so yes I've got one last question what is your opinion on super dry the love it really? well now it's just a supplement uh -huh. you the little the little, little bottle okay yeah, well, there's a product called super fried 
but y'all, I call it snake oil. But it is good snake oil. And if you got a plant that's suffering, and you want to perk it up, I'm glad you brought that up. But if it's suffering and it needs some help, super fried it. And I'm sure they probably got it. If they don't, they'll get it. Huh? Yeah. They, do they have it? Yeah, they do have it. Okay, good. And y'all, it says, it looks like snake oil. The little label on it, it's just funny looking. But it's, it's like four drops to the yeah. gallon or something like that. And it's incredible. It's, I'm sure it's what it is. It's like vitamin B's, because you smell it. It smells yeah. like vitamin B's. But it's got a little, it, you don't know what's in it, but it works. But you still got to fertilize on top. Yes, yes, it's just a something. Okay. It's kind of like a minor element. Okay. Yeah. Or a crazy Thank you. Yes. Yes. Look, I think you started to touch on the three words. Okay, uh, the pre-emergent for the lawn, the one I believe in is atrazine. Now, like I said, we're finding some, uh, some um, top, what you call it, tolerance. I'm getting, I'm not wording it right. But some weeds are getting top. Well, I said, there you go, thank you. Some weeds are getting resistant to it. But as long as they're not, it is the best because it is pre-emergent and post-emergent. In other words, timing is so critical on pre-emergent that if you don't put it on at the right time and your weed is already sprouted, I don't care how little it is, you won't kill it. But if you um, actively, if it's already coming up, it'll kill it. And that's why it's good. And you use it in the spring and the fall. And a 50 pound bag does 10 to 12,000 square feet. It's like $30. And, um, and it works good. Now, one thing I didn't touch on is this fertilizer does not have a spreader setting on it. Y'all, spreader settings are for the birds. No, no spreader setting is correct. I don't care. I you buy a ten thousand dollar spreader, it's still not going to have the right setting. You've got to calibrate it. Okay, don't calibrate it, but here's how you calibrate it. I mean, this is how you do it. Um, you take this bag right here. This is ten pounds. That covers two thousand square feet. No, a thousand square feet. See, we wrote it up there. Five pounds per thousand square feet. Yeah. So you put five pounds in, a, in that spreader right there, set it on a small setting. All right, the smallest setting, it'll still flow on. And you go this way and this way on a thousand square feet until it runs out. And you've got the best spreader setting in the world. But if you set it on Scott's six or ten or whatever, uh, you're going to run out way before you get finished or either you're going to have too much and not know what to do. So do it in your way. Don't worry about settings. Just set on a small setting. Just go like a grid and, and you're active. Whereas any other way. And remember, a pint's a pound. All right, you, you've got a odd ball shape. Um, just kind of estimate 1,000 square feet or 2,000 square feet and just go back and forth until you run out. Even on this stuff, if you get too much, you're not going to hurt anything. It's just going to hurt your pocketbook. 